Good evening and good day to everyone who are joining in now. Let's just give a few more minutes for others to come in. We'll be starting. Okay, for the information of uh, all the participants in this uh, evening's uh, webinar series, <clears throat> this is our fifth of a series for the grant jurisdiction. Uh, if I may please guide you uh, tonight, um, during the lecture, um, we will all be on silent, of course, we'll be, we'll be listening to our uh, lecturer. And if you have any like uh, greetings, Put it in the chat. If you have any questions, put it in the Q&A, okay? So the Q&A is just below your screen. You will see it, Q&A. All questions regarding the lecture, please put it on Q&A. All greetings or any announcements or any notes that you want to say, put it on the chat, okay? So just, just to be clear, if you want to raise your hand, I see like three people raising their hands now. Uh, look, Ben Lue and uh, Gilmore Bot, uh, Botardo and Gary Banak. Um, sirs, please, uh, I will lower your hands now. Uh, later on, after the lecture, if there are any questions, 
you, uh, please course your questions through the Q&A. Okay, so we will be more organized about it. Um, our very worshipful lecturer for this evening, the rock star of the Grand Lodge of the Philippines, uh, SGL uh, Teodoro Carlo de Forte de Calao, um, will try to answer all your queries and questions for, for this evening. Again, <clears throat> due to the current circumstances that we are facing um, as a jurisdiction, um, our most forcible grandmaster, most forcible Agapito S. Juan Jr., um, instructed us, our very full, our very worshipful uh, senior grand lecturer and our very worshipful assistant grand secretary and myself to come up with this uh, lecture series. So the brethren will somehow be appraised of uh, situation things and, and um, be able to be updated on how things are happening. And this will also be a venue for us to continue on with our Masonic uh, education. So this evening, Again, brethren and guests, we are honored and privileged to have with us our very infatigable uh, Grandmaster, who I think uh, do not even know what uh, getting tired is because he always is at the Grand Lodge. He works on uh, a lot of things, making sure that even after under pandemic, uh, a lot of things should be worked out, uh, not only within the jurisdiction, but uh, among the brethren as well and supporting the communities where we are. And as you can see now, he's even at the Grand Lodge of the Philippines uh, trying to make sure that uh, he will be able to support us in this evening's uh, lecture. So without much further ado, uh, we'd like to hear now, uh, Most Worshipful Grandmaster, we have about 200 participants already this evening who have uh, signed in. So uh, this is another successful evening, as I may say, uh, ahead of uh, the lecture. So I think everybody's ready now, Most Worshipful Grandmaster, to hear your message. Brethren and guests, please welcome Most Worshipful Grandmaster of the Most Worshipful Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of the Philippines, Most Worshipful Agapito S. Juan Jr. Sir? Thank you very much, Very Worshipful Dennis. Very Worshipful Oliver Yabot, our Assistant Grand Secretary. Very Worshipful Teddy Kalau, our Senior Grand Lecturer, the rock star of this webinar series. Very worshipful Dennis Conanan, our Chief of Staff. Very worshipful sirs, worshipful sirs, brethren, good evening to all of you and hope that all is well and everyone is safe. I have a number of important developments to share with you. First, on administrative matters. Last October 15th, I issued circular number 50 which assign official email address to each subordinate lodge, Grand Lodge office, and some GLP personnel, among others. This is not only intended for efficiency of doing business, but also to implement a COVID-related measure. We wish to minimize physical contact with the Grand Lodge by Masons who transact official business such as filing of required reports. Lodge secretaries and other officers need not come to the Grand Lodge for such routine transactions. And we hope that we can actually take full use of this by next month after we have registered all users into our network. Related to this, we shall also put in place a responsive online payment system for dues and fees and also for your purchases for Masonic supplies. We intend to require all large treasurers to connect with GCash. The GLP has already launched this system since last year for donation purposes. And now we shall put up a system so that all official payments of lodges can be coursed through your treasurers using GCash facility without problem. We shall issue a circular on these ones. We have perfected an ideal GCash payment process. I now go to our esoteric business. Last October 17th, we have conducted an unofficial online voting of DDGMs and large officers in order to get a consensus on whether or not 
the cancellation of the December election of large officers and the extension of their term will be generally acceptable to all. Prior to that, we have instructed the DDGMs to consult with their respective lodges and get their sentiment. And the result of the canvassing shows that 91% of the lodges favor such move, while 9% prefers to have an election for various valid reasons. Following such canvassing, I shall now cause the issuance of an edict on the cancellation of election and extension of term of office of elective large officers until December 2021. However, I shall issue dispensation for lodges with absolute need for election, such as death, sickness, resignation, or non-attendance of previously elected officers. On the conduct of degree works, some brethren are asking whether there will be a special circular on the matter in view of COVID-19 issue. Please note, brethren, that we have previously issued Edict number 328, which already contains very strict procedures on the conduct of degree works. Long before the advent of the pandemic, we have already instituted a no contact policy on degree works. Let us just implement this edict to the letter. Brethren, although we have allowed the conduct of stated meetings, yet we are still operating on an abnormal mode. The situation of a large differs from another depending on quarantine status, age of members, and their prevailing health condition. Some lodges still cannot open because of government restrictions like our overseas lodges in Guam and Micronesia. And some lodges prefer not to meet because of safety issues. This is accept acceptable and I simply issue dispensations to officially record the official status of such lodges for a given month. Lodges who cannot meet are encouraged to do online caucuses and perform charitable activities, if any, which you may record and file for your own purposes. However, only official business transacted or recorded in a regular stated meeting shall be given official recognition. We continually adjust as we go, and this will be our new normal for the time being. As always, brethren, what matters is the well-being of members and all our usual business and processes must give way in favor of our health and safety. We persevere, but with prudence. Again, brethren, thank you and good evening. Thank you very much, Most Worshipful Grandmaster. Uh, I think your uh, message this evening and your announcement will be trending for the rest of the evening and until tomorrow and the next few days. You definitely uh, uh, brought uh, in a lot of uh, information for the brethren to talk about and will add up to the value of this evening's uh, lecture. So to each and everyone who are in this uh, lecture this evening, um, we are very honored again to uh, have as our lecturer, our very dependable senior grand lecturer. Uh, we call him the rock star of uh, the Grand Lodge because when every time he gives a lecture, no less than 500 registers. So, ano yun? That he raised the bar you know, of, uh, of lectures. Um, for this evening's lecture on Masonic philosophy, the Masonic Initiatic Experience, Concept, and Rationale. Please welcome again our very worshipful Teodoro Kalo IV, our current senior grand lecturer. Very worshipful, sir.
Thank you, most worshipful sir, for being with us today. And thank you for your message. Thank you very much, Kuya Dennis, for introducing me and moderating today's discussion. Just have a warning tonight to all brethren. Good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I understand uh, we have an international audience uh, that is coming to watch uh, this. Just two caveats. One, we're having sporadic in, uh, internet issues today. So if we get disconnected, just wait two minutes while we reconnect again. Second, because this is the Philippines and this is geared towards brethren here, there are times when I will go into the local dialect. I'll try as much as possible. Uh, and those are usually times when uh, it involves something humorous. I'll try as much as possible to make a translation. But I think you can get it from the context if I do so. The topic that we're going to go today, if you look at our webinar series, is Masonic philosophy. And today we're actually going into the concept and rationale of what all Masons go through when they join the fraternity. And that is the three craft degrees of our philosophy. So, what are we going to... Uh, what are we going to be taking up today? Basically four things. One, as I earlier highlighted, uh, two webinars back uh, with regard to who are Freemasons. There are a lot of people who claim to be Freemasons, but they're not. And they give the fraternity a bad name. So before we talk about Masonic philosophy, I am going to talk about who exactly are regular Freemasons. And... What is this philosophy that they practice? Because if you don't understand uh, who specifically we're talking about, you could end up thinking that this applies to anybody who calls himself a Freemason. Like, for example, criminal gangs in Italy, right? They may call themselves Freemasons, but they're not. They are not the ones that practice this philosophy. And I think a lot of confusion arises because out, uh, those who are not Freemasons mistake, you know, uh, those who call themselves Freemasons from those who truly are. So we're going to define the practitioners of this philosophy that I'm going to explain today. And that philosophy is very comprehensive. It involves major schools. There are major, what you will learn from another le uh, lecture may be different from what you will learn today. It doesn't mean that we're practicing different philosophies. It's because we belong to different uh, perspectives of what the philosophy is about. And it's sort of like describing an elephant from different angles. If I'm in front of the elephant, I will be talking about its trunk. When somebody in from the side will be talking about how big that elephant is, right? So the major schools of thought, of uh, Masonic thought, which many outsiders don't actually know, we will clarify today. Uh, so if you're an outsider, you'll know that there are many ways of practicing philosophy. And if you are a Mason, you will no longer be confused if during when you receive Masonic education, you appear to get an interpretation that is different from what another lecturer said. It's all about different perspectives. Third, once we know what's once, once we define what regular Freemasonry is about and go through the major schools, then we can talk about what the three degrees really mean. Now, this is a public webinar. It's internationally webcast. So obviously for fellow brethren, I will not be going into what actually happens in the degrees. What I'm going to talk about are the, is the concept and rationale of why we have three degrees, what you're supposed to learn very basically in each of them. And essentially, what are the major lessons? Here's the thing. There's a lot that you learn when you enter the fraternity. And sometimes you get confused because it's not organized in a way that will readily, uh, you can absorb. And because it's cut into three degrees, you might forget some of the ideas in the first or second degree when you finally finish the third degree, right? So for the first time, what we're going to do now is we're going to highlight, and I think this is the main point of the webinar, we're going to highlight the seven main ideas of our philosophy. 
Now, this is not secret. If you study books that are available in our, uh, you know, that you can buy in Amazon or you can buy in our local bookstore, if you study, uh, these are readily available books, you will find these. But it's been difficult for many to understand. We recognize that our philosophy because they've never or been organized together to highlight these seven basic concepts. Now, I must let you know, these seven basic concepts are just the starting point. It is a very deep philosophy, but what we're trying to do here is orient you so that when you go further, this will always be your anchor. When you go further as a Mason and you study our philosophy, you can never go wrong with the seven concepts that we're going to talk about today, particularly as they are organized in this way. For each of the degrees and the starting point, your candidacy, we tell you what the main idea is or the main ideas are. Okay? So let me highlight again, brethren and our guests tonight, you are not going to be an expert in Masonic philosophy. Okay? When you finish this session, it is a very deep and but a very wonderful uh, discipline to really study. Uh, we invite you, our brethren, after this orientation, if you haven't done yet, to go through the relevant course. There is a there is a course on Masonic philosophy that is part of our diploma program for Institute of Masonic Education and Studies. And because of this pandemic, we've already pushed forward with our online uh, version of that diploma program. So if you're interested, now is the time to get your diploma now for our brethren. Okay, so those are the four things that we're going to talk about today. Who are regular Freemasons? And I'm talking about those who are members, in particular, of the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of the Philippines. One. Second, when it comes to Masonic philosophy, what are the different perspectives? We'll talk about the major schools. So from there, we will get to understand what does it mean to go through the three degrees? Why three? Not four. 7, 13, 100. Why three? We will go through that because it is part of a comprehensive initiatic tradition. And so that you'll have a takeaway from tonight, okay? If you were going to focus on just what, there are seven, and we will link it to your candidacy and each of the three degrees tonight, okay? So going forward, Let's talk about first, uh, with, the, with those objectives, we'll talk about the really, really big picture who are regular Freemasons and uh, what is Masonic philosophy. Before we talk about B, the three degrees, what lessons can we learn from them? There are seven I've uh, highlighted. As long as you remember those seven, uh, we hope you will get to enjoy philosophy as you go further in becoming a better Mason and a better man. Okay, And we'll end with a poem. A poem about when can you really say you truly are a Freemason. Okay? But first, the really, really big picture. Okay? There's a lag. Okay. The really, really big picture. Okay, so who are regular Freemasons? Uh, uh, what do you mean by Freemasonry? Then we'll talk about Masonic philosophy and the fact that regular Freemasonry essentially is all about implementing or, jo or going through an initiatic tradition for you to be a full member. First, I want to highlight there are many people who say that they are uh, let's just wait for the slide to okay I want to highlight that again many people can claim that they're Freemasons and even within the fraternity okay there are those who are expelled or those who end up with beliefs that are not consistent with regular Freemasonry when we talk about Freemasonry tonight we are talking about those who are members of the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of the Philippines, which is a national institution here. Uh, and why is that a national institution? We have it, uh, you can go to the Facebook page of Cable Toto, 
go through again the June webinar when we highlighted during Independence Day uh, what makes the Grand Lodge of the Philippines a national institution. When you talk about Freemasonry here, you talk about this definition. Essentially, three important points. We're the oldest fraternity of free and rational men who use symbols. What kind of symbols of those? Symbols of operative craftsmen, craftsmen who build uh, cathedrals or houses or buildings and convert their symbols what we call working tools, into lessons. Uh, we symbolize moral lessons so that we get to learn together a comprehensive three, a comprehensive and within the ecumenical context of our respective faiths. That in a nutshell is your elevator pitch. That's what, the, that's what you can say for brethren. If you ever need to ha define what your fraternity is and you have a, only one elevator right to do it, that, in a nutshell, is what we represent. And it highlights important things. Like, for example, we're not a religion. However, we do require our members to be religious. Why? You'll find out later. And second, it involves a lifelong journey. A lifelong journey where eventually, we hope your peers in Freemasonry can say you truly are a practitioner of the craft based on the seven key ideas that we're going to talk about today. That's important. Look at the, at the bottom of the screen. You'll see that all of these three presidents, I think there, there are more, okay? But we highlight these three US presidents because they all had something to say about this lifelong journey. Many times you will falter. Many times you will ask yourself, or your brethren will ask you, wow, labu naman. I mean, that, that was a mistake, or I don't think that is a proper for behavior for Freemason. Many times we will falter. But the point of the philosophy is not that you will falter, because you will, but you to get up and continue to strive to improve yourself. We're not God. We are men. And our life, our finite life, it's all about improving ourselves and creating value so that ultimately, when we pass on from this brief life, our brethren can say, Mukha nga, he is a Freemason. Okay, so how does that fit in the wider universal context of Freemasonry worldwide? Well, as you know, the Grand Lodge of the Philippines came about not because uh, we just decided to organize, right? Uh, we, are, we, have, we are descended from uh, what you call the system of regular Freemasonry. Uh, and we can trace it all the way back to the original Grand Lodge that started that system. From us, the uh, Grand Lodge of the Philippines, we have our mother Grand Lodge, which is the Grand Lodge of California, which in turn has a mother Grand Lodge, which is the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, which in turn has a mother Grand Lodge, which is the Grand Lodge of uh, England, the United Grand Lodge of England, which is a mother Grand Lodge of the world. You want a little more of this history, you can go back to the June webinar, okay? The mother Grand Lodge of the world has highlighted that in order for you to be considered a regular Freemason, you must follow eight basic principles. Those principles you can divide. Four principles relating to ethical philosophy, Freemasonry, the craft as uh, practice as an ethical philosophy, and four principles highlighting that the craft is a social institution. You see it there, okay? As an ethical philosophy, all Freemasons must believe in one God. Why one? You'll find out later. All Freemasons also, when they enter, they will be required to commit themselves to the philosophy in what we term as an obligation that they commit the, you know, on with their faith as their foundation. It is a philosophy that essentially seeks to mentor you to become a better man. That is why membership is exclusively of males. And it is a philosophy that is learned through three degrees. There will be more, you can go deeper, but those three degrees are essential. 
That is the core of the philosophy. And the way that is expressed is through what we call the social institution of Freemasonry. All the social Freemason, the, this social institution has four major characteristics. All grand lodges in the world, although they are all sovereign within their territory, trace their origin back to the United Grand Lodge of England. That's what number, the first principle means there. And then principle six, seven, and eight of this list relate to the other characteristics of being a social institution. When you attend a meeting, you will see the volume of sacred law. If it is a predominantly Christian, uh, Christian lodge, you'll see the Bible. If it is a predominantly Muslim lodge, you'll see a Quran. If you have both, you'll see both there, right? Why, why believe in one God but many faiths? You'll find out later, okay? And then, in addition to that, you have the square and compasses in that altar. Again, why those three? The volume of sacred law, the square and compasses, again, you'll find out later, okay? And then also, it also, uh, as a social institution, we practice two principles. We facilitate tolerance by prohibiting religion, the discussion of religion and politics within the lodge. That's so that we can better have fellowship together, okay? Uh, and that is our main difference, uh, regular Freemasons. That is the main difference between us and continental Freemasons because continental Freemasons, they are a very liberal uh, branch of Freemasonry. They don't have this, number seven, nor do they have uh, principle number two, okay? Uh, uh, belief in God, many, many of the Grand Lodges. That's, our, that's a major distinction. Principle number eight also is while we facilitate tolerance, we also want to avoid innovation. Why? Because the ritual of the first to three degrees, they present immemor um, they present lessons that are immemorial. I mean, th those are lessons that transcend time. And in order to make sure that you don't end up fouling up those lessons as much as possible, innovation is discouraged when it comes to presenting those three degrees. So that, if you follow these eight principles, brethren and guests, you can say you are a regular Freemason, whether you're a member of the Grand Lodge of the Philippines or the Grand United Grand Lodge of England, or any of the 52 Grand Lodges in the United States. There's a Grand Lodge for every state, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, okay? So, and and uh, also, if you're in um, those Prince Hiram, uh, I'm sorry, uh, those Prince Hall Grand Lodges recognized by as regular, you must follow these eight principles, okay? So with that, before we go to the schools, if, if you understand that this is the definition of Freemasonry, then we can go into... How, how, what is Masonic philosophy then? For that, we have our first poll. Okay. Poll number one, for those of you in the webinar, this is the main benefit of you. Now you can test your uh, conventional wisdom or, some, or what you picked up from actually going through your degrees as a Mason. Which of the following correctly identifies the four major schools of Masonic thought? Answer A. Rational, practical, spiritual, and historical. B, no, there are no such schools. If you read the, the title of uh, Morals and Dogma, which is the, one of the major works promoted by our Scottish rite, it's uh, by Albert Pike, okay, he's the editor. Masonic philosophy is dogmatic in nature, so everything is just one school. Or is it C? Descriptive, prescriptive, enlightened, and rational. Sounds funny. Okay. Oh, uh, baka, maybe it's the esoteric, mythical, authentic, and practical. That sounds funny also, right? What, which of these can we launch the poll? So which of these answers is correct? Is it A, spiritual? Hmm. Or is it B? No, it's just one school. Or is it C, descriptive, prescriptive? Hmm. 
up. Maybe this is correct. Enlightened. Oh. Or is it D? Esoteric, mythical, authentic, and practical. Hmm. Mythical, baka malabo yata yan. Hmm. Uh, very wishable, Dennis. Have we launched the poll? Okay, good, Teddy. We'll, we'll launch it now. Okay. There. Just, just the answer choices, uh, very worshipful Dennis. Okay. Maybe we'll give uh, everyone. Uh, there are two hundred fifty. Yeah. Uh, attendees is, on the webinar. Yeah. This is very exciting. <laughs> you know, let's, they're, they're, uh, they're let's answering fast. <laughs> uh, uh, brethren, brethren. You are not going to be graded, okay? So please don't change your answer. I can see that some of you are changing your answer. You don't have to. <laughs> you are not graded. And and to be to be frank, okay, you you this is normally not covered uh, in IMES because uh, IMES, the philosophy course, subscribes to one of these schools, so it's not really covered. But you know, you know, so don't no need to change your answer. I will just see if you can uh, pick one. D, mythical, ano yun? Or C? C, mukhang, mukhang tama to Rational, di ba? Mm. Ay, ayun yun, may rational rin ang A. Baka A. Pero may spiritual eh. Di ba? Is Freemasonry a religion? Hmm. Baka A. But they're spiritual. Di ba? Or o baka C. Or safe bet. B na lang. <laughs> B na lang. With no schools. Right? What do you think? Okay. 70% have voted. Let's have uh, one more uh, round. Baka nga D. Kasi authentic eh. Hmm. Sounds, uh, sounds, uh, sounds, <laughs> sounds correct. So, chat, so chat with Eddie. A seems, uh... <laughs> the chat they're answering A oh. and uh, and D. Tapos sa uh, okay. sa Q and A. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. when you look at it, <laughs> yung mukhang itong A, uh, you know, mukhang ang tama to kasi rational, di ba? Practical, di ba? Hmm. Pero may practical rin ng D. Baka mali nga yun. Kasi A and D may practical. Then that, C must be right. Kuya Dennis, right? What do you think? Maybe we'll have 30 seconds more for the remaining 30%? Yeah. Yeah. So, we're getting good then. Okay. Good replies. 15 seconds and then uh, we'll end the polls. For, for those of you in Facebook, I'm sorry, but we can't see your answers. But please, uh, you know, uh, that won't prevent you from putting your answer so that uh, your fellow Facebook attendees, they can, uh, they can debate on how you put that answer uh, among yourselves there in the Facebook chat. So feel free to answer in the comments of your Facebook. But what we're seeing now are those who are webinar attendees. Okay, Kuya Dennis, we can end the poll now. Yeah, we ended the poll already, Teddy. We're just waiting for okay. Zoom to yeah, okay. And the results are there. You go. So overwhelmingly, uh, we have a majority who voted A, rational, practical, uh, practical, spiritual, and historical. Let's go to the those those who said uh, the six percent who said that there are no schools. I'm sorry to highlight that. The, the statement there is clearly wrong. Masonic philosophy is not dogmatic in nature. When you say dogmatic, you're essentially saying that you must believe in very detailed principles. And if you don't believe in those principles, like a religion, you don't subscribe, uh, you cannot be a adherent to that uh, religion. That's what we mean by dogmatic. Uh, Masonic philosophy is susceptible to many interpretations. It has uniform principles, but many interpretations, so it cannot be B. Now, it also is not C. 
Okay, because uh, as you will see later, these are uh, characteristics of the schools of thought, but they are not how we label them. So you're down to A and D. Okay, it basically goes to 25% of you, uh, one fourth of you saying it's D, and 54% of you saying it's A, maybe because the words seem simpler uh, in A. I would like to congratulate the 25% of you who said D because uh, you are correct. So if uh, you feel you need the prize, just call up very worshipful Dennis and he'll find something for you. Good luck, <laughs> Dennis. Okay, so why D? Well, <laughs> why D? Okay, well, uh, let's just go. Let's just wait for the slide to come up. Okay, why D? Because when we let me highlight how those schools develop. First of all, B, as in boy, the answer for boy is wrong. Masonic philosophy, this is the reason why. Masonic philosophy is applied in a secular fashion. That is uh, secular ethics and it's not unlike a religion enforced in a dogmatic manner. Like we said, these are uniform principles, but interpretations may vary. And they vary because, okay, of these four schools that I want to highlight here. The most popular school in the 1800s into the early 1900s was, we call, was what we call the esoteric school. The primary adherent of that, especially when the Scottish Rite became very popular from the 1870s up, is the person you see here. That is uh, most worshipful, Albert Pike. He was served uh, one of the longest serving uh, heads of uh, a major appended body called the uh, Scottish Rite. And uh, he based the, the esoteric school, of which he is one of the primary adherents, basically views Masonic thought as a gateway to the subconscious self and how you contemplate the meaning of life. Uh, it's one of the deepest schools. And sometimes it's get, it, it can be very difficult to understand, especially if you start are just starting in Freemasonry. The leading proponent of, Mason, of this uh, school of Masonic philosophy here, if you attend our IMES program, hopefully you, you get him as your lecturer, is a very worshipful uh, Vic Hao Chin. Okay? And this philosophy essentially focuses on the ultimate meaning of why we are uh, humans, okay? Uh, a sub-branch of that school that branched out went into focusing on what should we celebrate and promote about our being human. And that is what we call the mythical school. It branches out from the esoteric because Unlike the esoteric, which focuses on met what we call, if you're a lay philosopher, if you're a, you know, if you're in the academe, esoteric, uh, at the esoteric school focuses on metaphysics, the ultimate meaning of life, okay, the ultimate core ideas. Mythical school that di diverges from that and focuses on what should we champion and promote through what we call narrative legends. An example of that is a very popular bestseller called The Hiram Key. Uh, that was just in the 1990s by uh, uh, Robert Lomas. And uh, basically this school wants to promote uh, how we can truly be human by the stories we tell each other. Now, clearly sometimes you can go overboard with that, right? And as a reaction to that in the 1900s, okay, uh, there were English Freemasons who said, Teka lang, this may be going a bit overboard. They were responding not really to esoteric, but the mythical school. And they said, we should go, instead of uh, looking at narrative legends, we should also ascertain okay, how we developed as an institution. So the authentic school, the best promoter of which is the leading uh, Masonic Lodge of Research in England. It's Quatur Coronati, Lodge number 2076. Okay. The school that promotes it is called the Authentic School. And they seek 
to view Masonic philosophy as something that must be founded on demonstrate if there is no basis for saying that we are related to the Knights Templar, okay? Then while we can cherish also their themes, we should not promote the fact that we are somehow historically connected to them. Which, which okay, because the mythical school is focused on the story, the narrative, the mythical school doesn't do. The authentic school says is, look, if we're going to do Masonic philosophy, you have to show, demonstrate that it is historical fact to the best that you can. Okay? Now, the thing is, when Freemasonry spread around the world, particularly when it hit uh, U.S. shores, okay, there were many brethren who, you know, sometimes they felt that, you know, going into metaphysics might be too deep with them. They really want to look at the philosophy as, as to what its core meaning is, which is how do you really develop or make men better? A leading example of that is uh, very worshipful Alan Roberts, the, the, the person you see here. Okay? Very worshipful Alan Roberts uh, is a prolific, one of the most prolific U.S. authors. And he wrote such works as Freemasonry in American History. And he has a biography of one of our leading, and I must say, probably the, uh, one of the uh, free, uh, U.S. presidents who most idealized Masonic ideals. Brother, most worshipful, he was Grandmaster of Missouri, most worshipful, Harry Truman, okay? The point of this last school, which uh, developed after all of these three, is to focus on the concept of mentorship. And I must highlight, I am a proponent of that school. Therefore, what you see here is not what you'll see in IMES, okay? What you'll see here is a, uh, follows that approach of that school. Okay, does that mean what I'm telling you now is all there is in Freemasonry? No. Like I said, all of these approaches, all of these approaches give something to the craft. How do they give it? Perhaps this is the one of the most important, one of the two most important slides in this presentation. All of these schools provide something to learn for all brethren. Okay. Let me start with the prescriptive perspectives on top. The, pres the schools which have a prescriptive perspective try to provide lessons to make you a better person. While the school, they, they are the uh, esoteric and practical schools. While the schools that are descriptive, okay, seek to describe, okay, what should be promoted and what we actually know in terms of a philosophy. Okay, there's another way of organizing this. Okay, so the prescriptive, what should we do? You're talking about how very worshipful uh, and actually very reverent because he was also a past uh, grand chaplain, very worshipful Vic Hao Chin, uh, one of our key lecturers in, the, in uh, IMES, uh, when, when he teaches, he lectures, his, his lectures are Freemasonry in the esoteric school, ethics as metaphys metaphysics. Why are we here? That contrasts to what you are learning today because I am a proponent of the practical schools, which is ethics through logic. How can we use Masonic principles to demonstrate how we should live? Uh, there you'll see there that book. Um, or I'll go to the books later, but basically that's what uh, the prescriptive perspectives are. That differentiates from the descriptive perspectives. Okay, the descriptive perspective, the schools which promote this, the, a descriptive describe the craft are mythical and authentic. What is a mythical? What is the story that we should champion? What is the narrative in masonry that we should champion? And it is these narratives that makes us human. So you can say that the mythical school is ethics through aesthetics. Aesthetics is the philosophy, branch of philosophy that study what is beautiful. Okay, the reaction to that is the authentic school, which is ethics as epistemology. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that asks, what do we really know, right? So 
you can see there are examples of popular books. Okay? Uh, just give me uh, two minutes. Brethren, you can see there are examples of popular books. And uh, the, what you see in the, on the, um, the left-hand side, okay, are if you want to really get into ethics uh, as metaphysics, uh, you, might, you can't go very far than to look at the leading text now promoted by the Scottish Rite, A Bridge to Light. Okay, by, that is by uh, Most Worshipful Rex Hutchins. I think he's the past Grand Master of uh, Arizona. It, is, uh, it basically summarizes the teachings of the Scottish Rite it, in a way that uh, will make you uh, contemplate what it means to be a human through masonry. Uh, the other book that maybe you should really look also into if you want to go into this side, which we call the mystical models. Why are there mystical models? Because they focus on very heavily on symbols, okay? The symbology of the philosophy, okay? So the esoteric side highlights what should we really be studying? What, while the mythical side highlights what should we really be promoting, championing? And the leading proponent to that, if you can't go wrong, is uh, the late worshipful brother, Les, uh, Leslie Wilmhurst. Okay. Uh, that is his book. It's, I think it's even available on the internet because it's, uh, it's quite old. It's The Meaning of Masonry. If you want to see how beautiful Masonic philosophy can be in terms of how the symbols highlight what we teach, can't go wrong with that. So that's the, myst the, the mystical side. The rational models are more uh, based on a logical foundation and evidence. Uh, what I have here before me is my grandfather's uh, book, personal copy of uh, Alan Roberts's Alan Roberts' uh, uh, most uh, very worshipful Alan Roberts' The Craft and Its Symbols. As you can see, I, I didn't touch it. This is his markings. Uh, this book was before my time. Uh, it was around before I was born. That's the cover there. If you want to get a similar summary in a different way, uh, you, can, you can't go wrong also. With uh, This is the best example of the practical school. It goes through the three degrees and it explains in detail the different symbols uh, that you encounter and the lessons of each degree. Okay? That compares to uh, the historical school. If you want an introduction to the historical school, a very modern one and a very short one is Freemason in an introduction by Dr. Mark Colt Rivera. This is a very uh, recent book, uh, just this decade. Uh, he is a 32nd degree Scottish Mason, and it's very similar to what you see now being presented now. It provides a very concise summary of what truly are the uniform principles of the craft. So in a nutshell, what are we trying to highlight here, brethren? Many of those who are not Freemasons, they get confused. They highlight something uh, in the, for example, the mythical side, which should not be seen as historical fact or worse, dogma, okay, or something that, you know, all nations should believe. It's an interpretation. And then they claim that, oh, because of that, okay, uh, you know, that shows that uh, your, uh, for example, Satan worshippers, there is a passage. All right, let's go to the esoteric school. In morals and dogma, dogma is not, is not in the traditional set. When you say dogma, it means teaching. When you go to Albert Pike's book, Morals and Dogma, there is a passage there when he talks about receiving Masonic light and he uses the term Lucifer. And just using the term, some critics take that out of context. Aha, Lucifer! Satan worshippers. No. When you read that passage, it's very clear. He's not talking about the devil there. He's talking about Lucifer in terms of what that term means. Lucifer 
okay in the old uh, in the in the the term really means uh, provider of light okay in the same way that worshipful is not you know religious in masonic terms it means respectful that's what if you read that passage that's what it means because outsiders don't know that these are the four schools present you get a lot of confusion now i know your question uh, very worshipful teddy parang napaka confusing to uh, paano mo ma-apply to okay okay so let's apply it very specifically let's apply how the ano, when you talk about the four schools you talk about you focus on the questions they ask and i'll give two examples here in this slide Let's talk about something uh, that is historical fact, which are the Order of Knights Templar. As you know, this order, they were declared as heretics and all of them, or almost all of them with the exception of those who escaped uh, from their grandmaster, Jacques de Molay, who was uh, martyred, going straight down. They were all killed because uh, the church pronounced them as devil worshippers and uh, whatever only to retract that in 2007 when it was clear that it was all based on fake uh, you know fake uh, documents okay and let's talk about something that's fictional uh, for those of you who grew up uh, with me uh, you're all fans of star wars let's talk about the jedi order so if we have these four schools yes very wishful dennis okay if we have these four schools how do you apply Masonic philosophy to these two sets. Well, for the Knights Templars, like I said, it's all about the you focusing on the questions that each branch asks. With regards to the Knights Templar, if you belong to like very worshipful how Vikauchin school, okay, what you're really going to ask is what does their experience of being persecuted or being martyred, what does that tell us about who we are? If you're like me, if you belong to the practical school, my question would be when I study them is, how can we model our behavior today based on, on them, on their values? If you belong to the authentic school, okay, like our cable tow editor, very worshipful Harold Santiago, okay, if you belong to that authentic school, you'll be more curious about what relationship, okay, whether it's historical or symbolic, what relationship actually factually exists? What can we prove from historical evidence uh, that the Knights Templars are indeed connected to Freemasonry? If not in terms of historical evidence, then the themes that resonate. Okay. Whereas if you're if you belong to the mythical school, okay, you might ask. Okay, there, there's an appended body of uh, Rosicrucians here. Okay, in in uh, in the Philippines, if you're if you belong to that appended body, you'd be curious. How you're, you're going to ask, how do we best commemorate the legends of these knights when we do masonry? So you can see all of us, very worshipful Harold is looking at history. Me, I'm looking at, you know, how we can learn and model our behavior. Very worshipful Vic, esoteric school, he's looking at, you know, what does this mean to us? The fact that they were persecuted, we all have different perspectives in researching and learning and writing about this event. And you can apply that not just to historic Jedi. It's, it's all fiction, right? The Jedi Order, Star Wars. If you were to talk about that, very worshipful Vic and the esoterics, those in, who are in the esoteric school, they're going to ask, how does the narrative, the movies, okay? What, how, how does that narrative of the Jedi Order exemplify what is important about being human? What is it in the story of Luke? Luke, okay, and Yoda, okay? And the redemption of uh, Luke's father. What does that highlight about our humanity? Whereas I, those of us in the practical school, we're going to look at can, what are the values there that we can identify and best practices that we can, you know, when we teach Freemasonry, we can say, look, George Lucas has also highlighted this in his way to better exemplify how we should be better Freemasons. If you're Kuya Harold, Kuya Harold and the, you know, our cable tow editor belong to the authentic school, you're going to look at, okay, this is fiction, but are there themes here 
in this narrative that are consistent with our values and what are divergent, what are factually divergent. Okay, what is consistent? The development of someone from Padawan to Knight to Master to Grand Master in the Order, right? But what is divergent? The fact that they are taken from when they are young children, younglings going up. In the yata must masonry yun. Masonry, you have to join when you are mature enough. So that's divergent. So Kuya Harold would be looking at that. Yeah, it's fiction, but are there themes that are consistent, factually consistent with what we teach? And what are the themes that we should highlight? If we're going to use this, uh, Kuya Tedia is divergent. Uh, factually, it, it, clearly, this is not uh, uh, consistent with the principles that we teach. And that is, you know, from birth, they are uh, develop, developed into Jedi Knights. Uh, malayo na yun, okay? Because you have to be mature to be a Mason. If you belong to the mythical, Order, you're going to look at how is this, how is the Jedi order in popular literature demonstrate cherished Masonicness? Because we have these similar narratives. And for all you know, maybe this Jedi order was developed with these narratives in mind. Okay, Maybe George Lucas was influenced. We, we don't know. But how can we best tell our story uh, through Star Wars for the younger generation. So that's how you do, that's how each school of Masonic philosophy approaches, approaches the discipline. And, and no one school can say, ah, mali kayo. Because all of us, a uh, very worshipful Vic, when, when he goes into uh, the mystical part of the craft, what he teaches you in IMES is just as important as what I'm highlighting here today. Uh, me being a, a proponent of the practical school. Okay? So, if you understand, brethren and guests, if you understand, therefore, that this is a comprehensive philosophy, you can therefore see why it's focused, the philosophy is focused on it being an initiatic tradition, which, if you read Wilmhurst, okay, uh, highlights is a step forward which should be taken with hope and courage. It's, it, 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 uh, it focuses on changing your life. Will it change the lives of everyone? No. If it's not done properly, you're not impressed. Parang, okay, ano yun? We have a lot of brethren and, you know, that's a tragedy. That's a real tragedy. If you just go through the three degrees and voila. Hindi mo na understand, di ba? But, but the three degrees, when you look at it, they are supposed to provide you with a way that you will eventually be reborn in a new way of thinking. A thinking that's comprehensive and that will fit your faith if you believe in one God. If you believe in one God. Okay? Why? We'll understand later. So what does that mean? What does it mean that it is an that that philosophy is an initiatic tradition? Okay? Well, we're talking about entrance. Entrance into something that you do not know. You're going to be initiated into. What are you going to be initiated into? You will receive knowledge. And you will be communicated that knowledge by means of recognition. Okay? That is followed by a special group who practice it to mentor each other. When you go through this, it's going to be a challenge. You might not believe all of it, okay? You might believe it's confusing, but you will be challenged. And it's the point is to challenge your thinking so that ultimately when you, we say you are required to take your obligation, you will agree with the philosophy. If not, then maybe Freemasonry is not for you. But when you subscribe to that obligation to practice the philosophy, and you will be, if you go through the three degrees, I can tell you what's inside the three degrees. I can tell you what, they're, what only what they're supposed to teach. If you go through, you will be required to take that obligation. You, to manifest that you commit yourself to follow this philosophy. This is the foundation of the three degrees. And your lifetime journey in learning what we call the craft. 
my challenge to brethren in particular here, whether you're members of GLP or not, is can you relate to this? And don't be ashamed if you can't, because unfortunately, if not performed well, okay, if you just, you know, you just pass through first and second so that you get to third, and then the third is like a party, okay, you're not going to get it, right? That's why it's important. You don't innovate ritual and you practice it properly. That's why we have a core of grad lecturers to make sure that ritual is not just changed, okay? When it's uh, during a Masonic year, it should not be just changed. And it should be properly and well done so that you will get this message. Okay? Now, knowing therefore that the philosophy is inherently an initiatic tradition, let's go to what that means, starting with this poll. Our second of three poll questions today. Why do Freemasons identify their fraternity as, quote, unquote, the craft? Ano yung craft na yan? Okay. We have four. It is important. This is important to you understanding the three degrees. Okay. Why do we call it the craft? Is it A, the original Freemasons were Knights Templar, persecuted by the Christian church, thus leading them to disguise themselves. Iba dyan naging baker. Iba dyan naging gardener. Diba? Pero even though you're a baker and a gardener, craftsman ka. O baka A. Or is it B? The term originates from the Teutonic word craft, meaning power and strength, as eventually applied to art skill, their skill, blah, 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 and final occupation. And finally, occupation. Hmm. Craft. Baka mali yan. Pa parang mukhang trademark yan. Eh. Like the, baka mali yan. Anyway, o C. Framework. Free, uh, Freemasonry originated from stonemasons' guilds who referred to themselves as craftsmen, o baka yan, who had the sole monopoly to cut stone to build structures. Or is it D? The term commemorates the founding father of the fraternity, Lord Craft. Ayun! Baka to. That looks, uh, that looks uh, good kasi Lord Craft eh. Hmm. Pero teka lang. Parang I never heard of Lord Craft. Baka mali to. Okay, okay. Let's have the poll. Very worshipful, Dennis. Uh, 250 present with us today. Again, do not change your answers. For all you know, you might be surprised. Yung palang cheese na ginagamit ko, yung pala yun. Oh, kaya pala. Baka yung nga, craft. Yeah. Diba? <laughs> craft cheese. Yeah, pala na. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why did you answer D? Ah, baka alam mo nga si Lord Craft. De, baka Lord Craft. Baka hindi title yan. Baka, baka first name. Parang speaker Lord Velasco, di ba? O baka, baka first name yan. Kaya pwede, di ba? Kaya Dennis? Pwede, pwede. Pala pwede, 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 pwede. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're getting um, 70% of uh, everybody... I think this one is perfect. Class, yeah. For the information of you're everybody. gonna like you're gonna like these answers, brethren. For the information of everybody, Teddy, we're having uh, right now we have 254 um, in our webinar and 311 currently viewing our Facebook uh, live. So thank you okay. to, uh, to our. Uh, uh, cable tow team for the Facebook live streaming. Okay, I think uh, three more percent and then we can close the polls. Yeah. You can share the results. Yep. Okay, we're closing the polls. Uh, thank you. Okay. So here are the results, brethren. Okay, let's start with obviously the obvious wrong answer. Only Kuya Dennis, let's, uh, well, Kuya Dennis and somebody answered D. Okay, uh, brethren, there is no Lord Crafta. Huh? If I actually find that you are a brother who answered this, 
I'm I, I will spend eight hours with you to uh, re-educate you about the philosophy. Okay, there is no Lord Crab. Okay, <laughs> baka baka cartoon yan, but there's no D. Okay, John cheese cheese. Um, clearly, clearly, the majority of you answered C, and that basically between C and A, you're correct in that sense. A, um, A is uh, you have similar stories A and C, right? Uh. A is actually from the mythical school. The authentic uh, school highlights that there's actually no connection between the Knights Templar and modern Freemasonry. That has not been historically proven. Okay, So for that, A is wrong. And therefore, the majority of you, 174, 89% of you highlight that it must be C. Here's where I like doing these poll questions. Brethren, you are only partly correct. So why? Because craft really, when we talk about craft, while it is historically true that uh, brethren call themselves craftsmen, the origin of the word is deeper in history. And this is where the authentic school comes in. Uh, they call themselves craftsmen, but that is because the original use of the word is German. Uh, it comes from a German word called uh, spelled K R A F T. So, for the own for the ten percent of you who answered B, congratulations. If you want a prize, you can lobby with very worshipful Dennis. Congratulations, and we'll find out why you are correct. Okay, so why? Because you go further back in history from those who are who answered C. That's why you're correct, and we'll find out now. Thank you very much for those who participated. And let's go to our, uh, let's go to why the, the, the one in 10 of you who said uh, B is correct, okay? Uh, that's what we're going to understand now. Why are the concepts of brother and craft important when we talk about the craft degrees? Because they are the, uh, it is from those concepts that we, get to see how the craft degrees are designed, okay? For those of you who attended my lecture, uh, the standard uh, Masonic education, uh, before this was an extended term last year, uh, if you attended my lecture in, um, uh, in each Masonic convention, you will know this already, okay? So the design and rationale of the three craft degrees are based on those two concepts, what it means to be a brother and what it means to be a craft. When you know the design and rationale of the three craft degrees, you will understand the seven core pillars of Masonic philosophy, which I've highlighted here today. Okay. Every stage, it highlights one or two key concepts. That's what you're seeing in this slide. And that's what we're going to thresh out uh, as we go through uh, this discussion later. But first, before we go to the core pillars, let's talk about the why. Okay, first, brother and craft. What do you mean by brother? Those of you who are attended the Masonic uh, education during our conventions last year, you already know this. Brother is from the Greek word frater. Okay, uh, that's what it means. Uh, brotherhood in Saxon, old, old English, or that's the basis for the term fraternity in Latin. Okay, there are two sources for its application. Uh, frater. Okay, the Greek word, you can see that in the King James Bible. When it was translated, the, the Bible translated it to English, frater became brother. Okay, the Greek frater word became brother. And traditional guild operative uh, practice to call each other that brother. So when you call each other a brother within a fraternity, at least the Masonic fraternity, uh, not other fraternities, within a philosophical fraternity like Freemasonry, the act of becoming a member is what you call brothering or brothering, okay? And that essentially has five components, okay? It's operative roots, okay? Uh, if you understand our history, uh, go back to the June webinar. We descended from operative guilds who had technical knowledge, okay? The operative rules are what you teach, okay? And you teach that through a method of a communication so you can identify 
who truly is a member of this of this brotherhood. Okay, so the, from those operative roots, okay, we became speculative. Operative Freemasonry became speculative when it became not just a trade guild, but a ethical philosophy for life. So that what we build anymore are not cathedrals, actual cathedrals, but cathedrals in our hearts, in, within our breasts. Okay? And you have to commit to that. You have to commit to that in terms of you have to subscribe to an obligation where you make manifest that this is the philosophy that I understand and I will follow this. Okay? You will kneel and say, I will follow this. Uh, you commit to it as founded on your faith. Some brethren here will see, wow, this is familiar. It looks like five points given to me in the third degree. You're correct, brethren. Obviously, for our guests, I cannot tell you what those five points mean. But for the brethren, if you're talking about the five points of you know what in the third degree, these are another way of interpreting. These are the five points. Okay? So that's the brother of concept. Here, it highlights the transition. The, the concept of brotherhood in Freemasonry highlights the transition from operative to speculative, to us being an ethical, practitioners of an ethical philosophy. And that is why we don't recognize them. There are three orders of women Freemasons in, the, in England, for example. We don't recognize them as regular Freemasons, but the United Grand Lodge of England recognizes them, uh, no, not recognize, sorry, acknowledges that they practice a version of Freemasonry, not regular Freemasonry, but a version of Freemasonry. Uh, and if you look at them, they don't address each other as sister. Why? Because of this. They address all their females, but they address each other as brother because they understand the concept of the term. They are not regular Freemasons, but UGLE acknowledges that they exist, which is to highlight, we cannot, uh, as, a, as a Grand Lodge, we obviously cannot accept women because we mentor men. But that doesn't mean the philosophy cannot be applied by women on their own. And the women who practice it in England, they understand the philosophy because they address each other as brother, not sister. Okay? So if you understand brother, then you can understand craft. Okay? Craft as a Masonic concept. And this is where the 10% of you can rightly knock on the door of very worshipful Dennis and claim a prize. Because before, going back in history, even before brothers in the operative guild addressed themselves as craftsmen, the word craft comes from Germany. It is the old Teutonic word craft, not craft chisa, but craft, which means power or strength, okay, as applied to an art skill or eventually your occupation. And this strength is the streamlined system of practical philosophy that we have developed. It will provide you with a foundation to become a better man, okay? And this strength, as, as, as symbolized by our practical philosophy today, let me highlight, brethren, has been validated by the social sciences. If you go at the theory of learning, which we call the hierarchy of learning, this is not Freemasonry, okay? This is, social, this is psychology. How do you learn something? You go through four stages. First stage, unconscious incompetence. You have no clue that you do not know. No clue. Okay, you don't know that you don't know, and then you go to a stage where, Oui, that's right, this is something that's useful. Conscious incompetence, you know, but you can't practice because you're, you just became aware. So then you become, uh, you, you start to learn it, to start to master it. Okay, how do you start to master it? You apply it, but it takes all of your effort and concentration. That's conscious competence. Sort of like men, all of us, di ba? Unlike women who can do four things at once, dapat tayo, if we do something, dapat nakakoncentrate tayo, di ba? That's, uh, you know, a gender, uh, a gender characteristic of men. You have to focus on something. That's why you get irritated if your boss, I mean your wife, 
says uh, something and you're in the middle of something, di ba? Conscious competence demands concentration because you're at it. It takes effort. So that ultimately when you master a skill, after maybe like 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, uh, you're a master, uh, you're a, you're a, you're a world-class pianist. Somebody asks you to play. No practice necessary. Gawa ka na. You're a golfer. Okay? Na, like Tiger Woods. Di ba? You can still play a good round even you know, because of muscle memory. That's unconscious competence. When it comes to the point where you already have developed something that you, know, you don't have to focus deliberate practice on. And that, brethren, is why there are three degrees. Because, you know, while they did not know this then, ultimately our brethren understood that learning occurs this way. Historically, if you're an adherent to the authentic school, like very worshipful Harold Santiago, you'll know, you'll, you'll tell brethren, oh, actually there were two degrees before only. Okay, there was fellow craft and entered apprentice. The master mason came about, the degree only came about in the 1700s as we transition into a speculative philosophy. Why did we do that? Because we're highlighting this. Okay? Just to, just to uh, further specify. So, social science, so psychological ladder. Okay, unconscious incompetence. What? When you do not know that you do not know, that's you. As a candidate, for our guest here, I cannot tell you what goes on in the three degrees because you don't know. But now, now that gives you an idea to apply, okay? Because you know this might be this might be something that can be useful to you. So if you're a candidate, the point of this stage is to ascertain your faith. Do you believe in one God? Your motives are they mercenary? How do we how do we ascertain that? Please go to our webinar last August. It's still on the, it's still on the uh, Facebook page of uh, Cable Toe. Okay, and qualifications. How do you admit candidates? We talked about that last August. This is important, okay? Because in order for us to prepare them to receive the degrees, we must ascertain their faith, motives, and qualifications. Okay, that they are not, for example, a fool. A fool in masonry is somebody who thinks that he can enter the craft with purely mercenary motives. If you were around in August, you will see that that is not the case. That's why we call you a fool as against being a madman. A madman has no rational uh, idea of, uh, uh, of life and therefore cannot join Freemasonry. That's qualifications now, right? But if you are a fool, you're going into motives, okay? So if you pass candidacy, you're balloted, you become, you take the first degree, you are symbolically going into that stage of conscious incompetence. When you enter, note, entered apprentice. When you enter upon the realization that you do not know, you do not know. Oh, maganda to. Uh, for those internationally, wow, this is great. Okay? That's when you commit to the philosophy. The first degree is there to demonstrate what the philosophy is to you and you committing to it. That is why it focuses on tenets, okay? It focuses on tenets and virtues. Tenets, what we truly value, and virtues, how we measure our commitment to those values. That's the first degree. Then, if you're okay, you want to go further, then you commit to the philosophy, you go into the second degree, which is symbolic of conscious competence. You enter into the rational world. When you strive to pass upon and practice what you know. Kaya nga passing as a fellow craft. What do you learn here? You'll see later. This is why the second degree, which is actually my favorite. Okay? This is why you learn the liberal arts, the focus on the liberal arts, reasoning, creativity, okay? And self-control. This is, this is why it's in that second degree. We are the second degree is all about deliberately orienting and developing your mind to prepare you to practice the philosophy so that when you become when you are raised raised as a master mason the third degree you can symbolically demonstrate 
unconscious competence, which is what you are aiming for the rest of your life. When you master what you know, kaya nga master mason, you master something enough that it becomes second nature. You practice the philosophy on a daily basis, which is what I want to ask brethren. Do you? Okay. In that regard, if you want to focus more on doing it daily, don't miss our webinar next uh, month when we focus on liturgy and uh, daily practice of Masonic or Masonic uh, philosophy using uh, using a liturgy. Okay. The the end the end message of that is is of how do you become a better Mason every day? Okay. So that is why we have three degrees. Even then, the brethren knew they were subconsciously focusing on this ladder. Okay, you are certain. Okay, you are certain. You know, if somebody goes to me and just highlights, oh, sali ako, magdududa ako. Okay, for those of our you in our international audience, I kind of doubt uh, whether I should talk to him about joining Freemasonry because, you know, this is not, you, you're not joining. Alliance Club or you know any other civic organization, it takes commitment. So if you just say join, uh, join how? I'm not gonna take you seriously, okay? If 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 that's what if that's how you think uh, you can join, okay? That's the first stage. But once you assert certain faith, motives, and qualification, believes in one God, and so forth, first degree, okay? Commit to the philosophy. Enter the prayer. He enters upon the realization. Wow. I didn't know this. So what can I know? So if he commits there, then we talk about the rational world, him achieving maturity. Okay? That's what the second degree uh, symbolizes. Him passing into being a reasoned man, orienting and developing his mind so that ultimately he will be raised symbolically as a master mason to practice for the rest of his life the philosophy. That is the why. We have three degrees, okay? Not four, not seven, not 13, not 100, okay? Going to just to highlight it in detail, okay? Unconscious incompetence in the candidacy. Effectively, you have a candidate. Seriously, ah, hindi lang, oh, join, join ako. No, seriously knocking on the doors of the Blue Lodge of his own free will and accord and demonstrating his openness to receive the teaching so he can be balloted and moving forward. Once he is initiated, he becomes an entered apprentice where we introduce him. From not knowing that he doesn't know, he knows now that this is something that he could use and he commits. He commits to the philosophy. So that goes to the second degree. Those of us in the practical school, you know, this is our favorite, the second degree. By the way, um, before I go to that, let me just go back uh, one slide. This is a uh, English uh, trestle board. Uh, if, if you join us, uh, if you were in the United Grand of, Land of England, not in the Philippines, but UGLE, they, uh, they this is what is shown you when they lecture you uh, during during the degrees. Okay. Uh, the first trestle board, this one, the Entered Apprentice trestle board, demonstrates the commitment that you must take to follow the philosophy. Uh, and you see that there's a symbolic uh, uh, Jacob's ladder going to heaven because you're, it highlights you're just at the start of your journey. Okay, so you're you're, you're passed into the fellow craft, right? So there you receive rational foundation and perspective. You, you, you focus on developing and becoming a mature man through the philosophy. And that is why you see here uh, on top, the two pictures here at the top, uh, you see here the English uh, trestle board for fellow craft masons. If you were to take, uh, like I said, different grand lodges, different, uh, some different uh, styles of teaching, yeah, if you were to take uh, your second degree in, in the United Grand Lodge of England, you'll be shown this. It shows a library and the steps, uh, a staircase of three, five, and seven steps. Those are symbolic. You'll find them out if you enter, which demonstrates the learning that you must uh, undergo 
in order to be exercise your faculties and become and mature in your experience to become a mature man and be raised to the third degree. And now this third degree, we focus on what we call the Hiramic legend, which teaches you three, implicitly, three core concepts, uh, which we will get to later. And that is when you learn these core concepts, conceptually, okay, not, not physically, conceptually you become reborn to you you are reborn to a new perspective about how to think about life let me talk about that you are reborn to a new perspective about how to think about life that's why you have that at the bottom that picture of uh of uh, the third degree trestle board there's nothing to be scared about it okay the coffin is there to symbolize that you are conceptually reborn to this new perspective about how to think about life, which is essentially, okay, what the Hiramic legend teaches is two things. The values we'll talk about later, but what it teaches first is the mortality, okay, of life. Life is finite, life is short. And, and second, the immortality of the soul. Your soul, it will go on, okay? you are reborn to that perspective okay so having said that okay let's now go to the seven core period we now understand this is why there are three degrees let me go through oh, each of those four stages candidacy and then each of the three degrees okay you are going to receive if you enter the fraternity a lot a lot of things symbols lessons teachings and sometimes it's like drinking through a fire hose okay for those of you who are about to enter the fraternity like our candidates or for those of you now you wish you could understand what you went through better i propose to you to focus first of all on just seven core concepts seven lang it's a very deep philosophy but with these seven core concepts, you cannot go wrong, okay? The first of these core concepts is something that you should learn when you are a candidate. We will ask if you believe in one God. Not many. We will ask if you believe in one God. We will not ask what your specific religion is. Only that you believe in one God, as symbolized by the all-seeing eye there, Okay? This is ULG, the United Grand Lodge of England's first basic principle. Belief in a single God. Okay? Uh, we're not talking about your religion. We're talking about whether you believe in one God. Why? As the guru of all senior grand lecturers, our current, our incumbent grand secretary, most worshipful Danny Angeles, likes to highlight, for all our guests and brethren, brethren, you know this, there is no salvation in pre-masonry alone okay there is no salvation if you just believe in pre-masonry and you don't have religion nako, it will not mean anything because uh frankly it's just it's it's a it's a it's a comprehensive ethical system and what makes it uh what makes it significant is if you have an anchor to it Okay, okay. UGLE six basic principle highlights. Okay, this anchor. Okay, that anchor is your belief in one God. Teka lang, bakit bakit napaka importante to? Because the distinction between one God and not many demonstrates how you view your religion. Let's go back to the ancient myths of the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, remember the Greek and Roman myths? Diba? They are myths of uh, many religions. I'm sorry, not many religions. Many gods. You have the full spectrum. In, among the Romans, they call the father of all gods, Zeus. I'm, not, I'm sorry, Juno, right? But the Greeks, they call Juno uh, Zeus, right? But you don't have to be a follower of Zeus, right? You can be a follower of Athena if you like. If you want to prioritize beauty, right? If you want to follow, I know, 
uh, if you are a wine merchant, your God, will, you want to prioritize uh, not Zeus or Athena, but Bacchus, the God of wine. Look what that's making you. Look what that's making you. It makes you pick. It becomes a game where the gods are using humanity as their playing field. That's what it means to have with many gods. A belief in one God, a monotheistic faith, however, highlights that there is only one divine will, not many, one divine will, one divine being who is all-knowing and who has a plan for you. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is that passage. I'm sorry, uh, memory uh, fails me now, but it highlights, and, they, and he has great plans for you. And you must be consistent with that. But that is, there is one God who is all-knowing. You are puny before him, but he is one God and he is all-knowing because there is one divine will. Humanity is not a playing field for, you know, different gods like uh, Mercury fighting Apollo or whatever. No, it is one God with one divine will. And we are going towards that. Now, having said that, let me highlight, masonry is not a religion. That is why we can say we must believe in one God, but all monotheistic faiths are welcome. That is why UGL's seven basic principle is tolerance by prohibiting, prohibiting partisan religious discussion. Now, somebody, some of you may ask, oh, teka, teka lang. this is a favorite. Um, this is a favorite uh, accusation among some Muslim sex and some non-Catholic Christian uh, sex like a, a version of the Baptist. You know, this is fishy. They, they, these, uh, these accusers say, this is really fishy. You're actually believing in, uh, you know, some kind of pseudo-religion there. Okay? When, when you get all of these people together. Okay? That's some kind of pseudo-religion. It's not. What it basically means when we welcome all men monotheistic faiths is, I... I believe that my faith will ultimately triumph. But I'm not going to kill somebody in the meantime or compel somebody to change his belief just because it's mine. Some outsiders might think, that's crazy. Why would you do that? Let me tell you, our brethren and our guests, isn't that what's happening today? Isn't religious intolerance a problem ages ago? For ages now. Isn't it because we have religious extremists that we have so many problems? Religious extremists. Because of the nature of religion being dogmatic, it's either you believe me or you die. And if it's not death, it's persecution. Okay? We're not like that. I believe my faith will ultimately triumph in the long run. But in the meantime, while we're working toward that, I can be with the Hindu, with the Muslim, uh, with the Protestant, with a with a Jewish member. We can all be together because we all believe in one God. We understand why one God is important. There's a divine will and plan. Let's just see. Let's just see going forward which faith will triumph. I believe mine will, but we'll see because I'm not God, right? Let's see how it goes. That is the first core concept of the craft. And everybody who must enter it must believe in this core concept. To get you to be uh, become an entered apprentice. Okay? And in the entered apprentice, so obviously I cannot tell you what happens during the first degree for those of you who are guests. But for those of you, brethren, if it went by really quickly, and it can, okay? If it goes by really quickly, if there are only two concepts that you should pick up from that, it is these two concepts. Okay? The three principal tenets, you will be lectured this. You will be lectured. It's, it's there if you don't remember it. Okay? If you don't, then I have to talk. A grand lecture I will be approaching your lunch very soon. Okay? Because it's in the lecture very express. Okay? The three principal tenets, which are our three fundamental values. And the four cardinal virtues, which are our four measures of one's conduct. How do they relate to each other? Our three fundamental values are those which we strive to uphold. 
brotherly love, our philosophy as a as a practice of mentorship and uh, a way to demonstrate respect for all humanity. Relief, okay? Us having a perspective for the other, not, not a selfish perspective, but a perspective for the other that is founded on empathy, learning empathy, learning to have emotional intelligence. That's relief. And truth, okay? Committing ourselves to rational contemplation for the common good. Okay, brotherly love, release, and truth. How do we see that we're going forward in those three values? We have the four cardinal virtues. That's, these are the symbols for them. Okay? Four cardinal virtues, four measures of one's conduct. Okay? Uh, what are these four measures? Temperance. Okay? Moderation in creed and in deed. Okay? Fortitude. How do you develop personal resilience? The will to keep moving forward. Prudence. How do you discipline yourself in terms of diligence and being discreet, acting properly? And justice. How are you fair to all and be a steward of what you are responsible for? Okay? How you are judged as a Freemason in upholding the three values? These are the measures. That is why we call them the four cardinal virtues. And let me highlight, it is a lifelong journey. You will fail many times. The point is not the failure. The point is getting up and striving and committing to keep going. Okay. So the first degree teaches us this. From not knowing, you are taught this to commit yourself to. Oh, so three concepts na yan. You get to pass, therefore into the fellow craft degree. What does a fellow craft degree teach you? Fourth major concept, the liberal arts. The use of reason as well as critical and creative thinking. Kaya nga may architecture dyan, ha? hindi lang logic. Okay? You talk about liberal arts. This is, uh, what you see here, okay, on this side, the graphic side, is the reason why the liberal arts are useful. Because with them, you can organize, create, lead, learn. Okay, and relate better with your fellow man, with, with your with all humanity. Okay. So the the my my favorite degree, okay, is the second degree. The liberal arts teaches reasoning as well as create critical and creative thinking. So here we aim to practice. It's a it's a stage of conscious competence. Strive to not only develop your mind rationally, creatively. And critically, but also be a lifelong learner. Anu? Lifelong learner. Very worshipful Teddy always highlights this. Someone na pulut yung lifelong learner. For those of our in our international audience, where'd you get this concept of lifelong learning? It's in the three jewels of a fellow craft. If you did not remember this, okay, for those of you who are brethren, if you don't remember this, a grand lecturer will visit you because it is expressed in our in our Liturgy. The three jewels of a fellow craft are the attentive ear, okay, the faithful breast, and the instructive tongue. Together, they symbolize lifelong learning. Learning, that is lifelong because learning, the attentive ear, is lifelong because it involves not only true and practical understanding, okay, it's not just, it doesn't just stay in your head, okay, but you're able to apply it. But it also must be expressed. You must know how to express yourself eloquently and effectively. And this goes if by practicing this throughout life. That's why you have the three jewels of a fellow craft. That's what they really mean. Okay? And if these are the express values, what you will be lectured on, if you go through the degree, you will see that there are also three implicit values which are highlighted in the second great light that is the emphasis of this degree, the compasses. What are, why second great light? Go back, go back to the UGLEs. Um, highlight uh, principle number six, the three great lights, volume of sacred law, square and compasses. This is the, one, the second great light, compasses. If you're a Christian lodge, the Bible, square, and compasses. 
The compasses are is the second great light that is highlighted here, and it highlights implicitly three values that this degree seeks to teach. One is self-control. When you use a con, that's what the compass is for. It control your passions within the bounds of civility. Second is discernment that you emotionally, rationally, and spiritually reflect on what you do. And third, third, tolerance. If you have self-control, you can understand why it's important to be tolerant because we have to celebrate and protect the diversity of humanity by avoiding undue or rash judgments. You your GLE principle number seven. Okay? Self-control, discernment, and tolerance, that's what the compasses highlight implicitly in this degree. So through the liberal arts and with the compasses, symbolically of, uh, uh, guiding us as to the implicit values of this degree, we move from conscious competence to symbolically unconscious competence. This is when you are raised to the third degree. And here you highlight the last two of the seven important concepts. The first of which is the Hiramic legend. As I earlier highlighted, the mortality of life and the immortality of the soul. That is what the legend is about. The legend is a story. For those who are non-Masons here, I'm sorry. I cannot talk to you about that story. If you want to know more about that story, please uh, consider joining. Okay, But it is a narrative. It is a story that basically symbolizes two things. The mortality of life and the immortality of the soul. What that teaches us okay, are three important concepts. One, life is brief. Okay, Mortality of life. Life is brief. That means that life is short. Life is what you make of it. You create value and strive to exit the world a better place for those after you. Okay? That's life. Furthermore, life is a journey signified in the narrative by the search for the lost word. Ano yung lost word? Sorry. You want to know about what that means? You have to join Freemasonry. That's what the Hiramic legend is about. But the Hiramic legend will teach you that life is a journey to make yourself better and to persevere in that journey so that you continue to be eventually continue to better yourself okay but that is the more that relates to the mortality of life hiramic legend also talks about the immortality of the soul because life is short because of our belief though in the presence of a one divine will and one god okay regardless of your faith one divine will and one god you know that while life is brief your soul is immortal and what that highlights is contemplation and prayer is important. You should live life not just for today, but for the life after. For those of you who uh, are into uh, traditional Masonic law, you will note that the legend, this Hiramic legend, is a landmark of regular Freemasonry. Its presence in the third degree cannot be dispensed with because it is core it is central to what the third degree is about. Okay? So that's what the third degree teaches you. I cannot tell you more about the story if you're not a Mason. You have to experience it to truly know it. But having said that, think about this. If you join, think about this when you go about. And for our brethren, okay, I know the third degree is incredibly exciting if done, uh, you know, some brothers get carried away, okay? If you were too shocked by shocked and awed by what was going on and you forgot that it meant something, this is what it means. That's what it means in a nutshell, okay? Having said that, we also get to see here the third great light. If you're a worshipful master, the leader of a lodge, that's why you have this jewel. The square is the worshipful master's jewel. It is highlighted, this third great light, Volume of Masonic Law, compasses. The square is the highlight of this degree. It highlights, like what we had, three implicit values in the second degree. We have three implicit values in this third degree. 
Okay? The jewel itself, the square, symbolizes integrity. Okay? How you square your behavior, how you square your actions, that's what we mean. The instrument essentially symbolizes that one should follow the moral life. Square your actions by it. That's what we mean by it. Okay? When you do that, you will realize that life is ultimately not about the needs of others. Remember, relief, that teaches you humility. That is why, remember the current theme of uh, this extended term, charity and humility. Humility is an implicit value of the uh, third degree. It's not, you won't actually, it's not taught to you. You should gleam it. It's not expressly given to you. You should gleam it from the lectures. Humility is all about that perspective for the other. And that is symbolized by the master who is the hero in the Hiramic legend. I'm not, I can't go into it in detail. But you know that there is a hero. And you know that he, something happens to him. You're supposed to model him. You're not supposed to model his pupil, protege, what we call our, who was act, someone or so, several of them who ended up being ruffians, okay? Ruffians, by that we mean, you know, evil people who betrayed him. What is the characteristic, this one characteristic of ruffians? They wanted what the master had. Give it to me or I will take it. Remember that term? I, I, for those brethren, remember that term in the third degree. Give me, you know what he's asking, give me black or I will take it. That's the ruffians. What this degree teaches you is that we shouldn't be the ruffians. Hindi dahil gusto ko. Our question should be, how can we create value for others? The master, what he was doing, why he became a master, that's creating value. The temple, remember? That we should model ourselves in him. And so that what we do lives after us. Like what happened in that degree. Okay? That implicitly is what the Hiramic legend is trying to teach us. We should not be the ruffians. We should aim to be the master. Okay? Hindi dahil gusto ko. Remember, that's, that's one of the most impressive, important phrases there. Give me the, you know what, or I'll take it. That's why it's a very dramatic uh, degree. We're not, let's not model, let's not model the ruffians. Model the master. Which highlights, therefore, the third and possibly, you know, like the two, uh, uh, important value that we have, it, most important for our governance, which is trust. In a nutshell, this value teaches us implicitly to do what is right even if no one is looking. Do what is right even if one is looking. You should understand this is important because all Masonic governance, our Masonic logo, all of our leadership roles is built on this one word, trust. Yeah, of course, you can look at the Masonic law book and you can say, yeah, when it comes to the Grand Master, there's, uh, you know, uh, put their, their, or their, you know, Grand Master and Master, you can hold them ultimately accountable. There are provisions on trials and so forth. But in the case of Grand Master, those trials were never used, right? Instead, we ask ourselves, when we look at the Masonic Law Book, wow, how come so much power is given to masters, to grand masters? In between, in between uh, annual communications, the equivalent of our annual convention, the, effectively the one-person congress is the grand master of our craft. The one-person congress of our craft is the grand master. He issues legislation, right? Same thing with the master. When the brethren install a master, okay, he 
exercises the sovereign authority of the craft within his lodge for the entire term until he becomes a past master and joins back again his brethren. Why so powerful? Because if you look at it uh, from the perspective of corruption studies, remember uh, the basic, uh, the classic definition of corruption, uh, discretion plus non-accountability leads to corruption, right? If you look at it that way, it doesn't make sense, right? Because you give effectively a lot of discretion, right? To those who lead us. But if you look at it from a Masonic perspective, you can see now that our these roles are built on trust. The brethren elect you. Okay, as Grand Master, well, from Junior Grand Warden up, they elect you as Grand Master. They elect you as Master starting, you know, starting from Warden going up. They elect you as Master and install you as Master because they put their trust in you. And one of the ways of truly desecrating the craft is when you violate that trust. All governance and leadership roles in the fraternity, they are built on that trust. For non-Masons, they call this servant leadership. It is because it is built on trust, okay, that that is why you have so much power. Those who are non-Masons will focus on the fact that you have so much power. Those who are Masons will understand that it is really not about the power but the stewardship inherent in your role when you are given it. Why? Remember the lesson on humility. It's not about taking it. It's learning about valuing yourself, uh, how you can value, create value, create value for others. So together, integrity, humility, and trust are symbolized by the master's jewel, the square, that is what ultimately the Hiramic legend seeks to make you practice once you learn its lessons. This is a journey, very brief journey. We will ultimately be held accountable before the one God we pray to. And I think we can best defend ourselves if we, in our life, seek to practice this integrity follow the right path, humility. It's Life is not about you. Okay? And trust. Have a stewardship perspective. When you are called upon to lead others, you always do so as a steward. If you can't understand that, well, then join, you know, join a civic club that has safeguards, you know, uh, but, but, in Freemasonry, it's not the focus is not on the powers you get as a Masonic leader. It's in the stewardship role that is entrusted to you when you are elected or appointed to that office. So, brethren and guests, when you look at it, it's a very deep philosophy. I haven't even gone through describing what happens during the degrees. But Essentially, the core, the core beliefs, essentially it's these seven, these seven core pillars. So for those of you, brethren, na siguro ng third degree, na shock kayo, shock and oh, wow, ganito pala. Ah, and then, wow, uh, after it, oh, I've, I've been accepted. Di ba? Now you know, this was supposed to be what you've learned. Okay? When you're a candidate, we must ascertain that you do believe in one God. And now you know why. You must believe in the power of one divine will. Okay? If you are, once you are initiated, okay, you be, enter and commit yourself. This is what you're committing to. To value brotherly love, relief, and truth as we define it. And you will be measured in terms of the four cardinal virtues, how you practice them in striving for these three values. What are those four cardinal virtues? Temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. All right. And moving forward, uh, if you commit to this and you are passed as a fellow craft, 
you begin a lifelong journey of learning. Okay? Lifelong learning, symbolized by the attentive ear. Okay? To learn something that's practical, the faithful breast, so that you can teach it to others and mentor other masons, other men, the instructive tongue. You must learn to teach it well. That's what the passing is about, practicing it. The compasses highlight the values of this degree. Second great light. Self-control, discernment, and tolerance. When you practice this symbolically, you are then you are therefore have the privilege of being raised to the third degree to become a master of his craft symbolically because this is a lifelong journey. In the third degree, you will learn a landmark of the craft, the Hiramic legend, which symbolizes the mortality of life and the immortality of soul. True prayer, okay? Immortality of soul, mortality of life. Life is short. Life is what you make of it, okay? How do you make the most of life? It's the square. Integrity in following the right path. You will fail many times, but what's important is that you strive to follow the right path. Humility in realizing that it's not about you. It's not about the ruffian saying, give it to me or I will take it. It's not about that. It's about you giving to others. Humility. Okay? And ultimately, okay, trust. When you lead others, it's not about enriching yourself or enjoying the position. It's how you are a steward to what is entrusted upon you. If you understand these seven core pillars, that in a nutshell is the core philosophy of regular Freemasonry. With that, brethren, let us now go to our final poll for the evening. And the question is, when can a member of the fraternity deem himself to be a worthy and well-qualified Freemason? Like, for example, uh, most worshipful Harry Truman. For those of you who don't know, most worshipful Harry Truman, I think is one of the best examples of being a craftsman. Uh, he was a former grand uh, master of the Grand Lodge of Missouri. Even when he was uh, president, he would go back to lodge in Missouri. Okay, and even though he was president, he he would sit. He would because in a lodge. The most important leader there is not, it's not based on who you are. It's the worshipful master. So he would sit among the brethren. That shows his humility, right? So when can you deem yourself a worthy and well-qualified mason? Is it A, such judgment is actually not up to him, but belongs to his fellow brethren? Indeed, you, it's the brethren. Or B, when you finish with the three degrees? Or is it C, na petition ka, pumasok ka na, yes. That's when you mean, that's when you can say you're worthy and well qualified because you have entered the craft. Or is it D, when you practice trust? When you practice trust, when you are appointed or elected to your first Masonic office, when you start practicing the concept of Masonic trust. Very wishful, Dennis. Let's have our final poll. Okay. Oh, brethren, huh? do not change your answers. You're not being graded. I can see some changing their answers there. I apologize, brethren, that this is a lot of it was quite deep. The um, handouts will, as like always, be circulated, and we will uh, we will keep uh, this presentation on the Facebook page of Cable Toe. If you want to go through it again, I recognize some of these concepts were quite deep. You can review it again, uh, you know. But what I hope is that for those of you who it went by, because you know the shock and oh, kayo by the first to third degree. Now you can realize, ah, ganun pala yun. Yes, yun yun. Okay. So sixty percent, kuya Dennis. Yeah. Um, we we'll give it a little more. Kuya Teddy, what a minute? Okay. Sixty-five. Okay. Maybe seventy. We're done. Yeah. Brethren, let me again highlight what I just showed you today is like if you if if Freemasonry was a philosophy, it's just the kernel, it's just the core, very small core of a very big universe. You are you will not be experts 
in Masonic philosophy just by learning this. But at least you have the foundation. You cannot go wrong with the seven core pillars. Okay? What you have is a core. Okay, let's end the polls. Good, Teddy. Okay. So, we finished with the uh, polls. And here are the results. Okay, Teddy, you see it? Into the third degree. It doesn't end. So be wrong. And correctly, also, many of you are. Uh, highlighted these um I think we had this uh, signal just had some issues. Uh, he'll be definitely coming back <laughs> to finish the discussion. But uh, just the same, we're sharing the results of the poll results um, that we just conducted. And um, I think he's, uh, he's coming back. So once again, uh, to all brethren who are here in this uh, webinar series, thank you for uh, for participating. Um, it's a very fruitful evening for each and every one of us. Um, we're just waiting for Versipul uh, Teddy Kalo's uh, signal to stabilize. And uh, we will be wrapping up the... Versipul, yeah. Okay, there you go. Okay, go, Teddy. Yeah. Very worshipful, Dennis. Can you co -host, make me co host again in the other account so we can. Uh, we can... Yeah. Okay, I think the signal of uh, very simple Teddy is uh, kind of challenging us of the moment. But uh, um, in in just a, a few a few minutes he'll be back. And again, let me let me thank everyone again for joining this evening's uh, webinar. Uh, it's been very enlightening and it's a very uh, very interesting topic about our Masonic philosophy, the Masonic initiatic experience, concept, and rationality. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, with this uh, undertaking, we we're able to somehow uh, help uh, enlighten some uh, thoughts and some uh, views, particular to our intellectual journey in in, in the craft. So, uh, to each and everyone, very well, simple. Teddy will be out uh, now. He's he's back. Teddy. Yes. Um... I'm trying to get the uh, co connect to the other one. Have you? Uh, can you? Uh, can you connect to the other account? It's not loading. Let me do so again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me do so again. Okay. Here we go. Okay.
Can you can you just make me um okay? Can you Okay, brethren, sorry for that. As I highlighted, we've been having sporadic. Um... Yeah. Okay, uh, if you see the screen before you now. Uh, Clearly, B is also wrong. B is wrong because it's the start of your um, uh, of your journey. It's not it's not the end. And D is also wrong correctly because uh, your appointment or election to a uh, office highlights that the brethren already trust you. Okay, trust you to fulfill that stewardship role. Okay, so just because they do that does not actually mean that they hold you as somebody who has truly become a Freemason. Okay? It could be because uh, they believe that you could further develop in that role. Okay? If you know that, then C is also wrong. Okay? C is also wrong because uh, that's when you are successfully uh, petition and you successfully ballot, you might not actually even finish the, de the degrees if for any reason you fail to continue or you don't pass the proficiency exam which are uh, required for these degrees. If after the third degree you don't pass the proficiency exam, then many privileges of being a master mason will be denied you. So what does that leave us? That leads us to the only rational answer here. For someone to be like Most Worshipful Harry Truman, uh, that will only be determined at the end of your life when your brethren will say, after you've, you've passed on to the great beyond, that you were indeed a Freemason by what they, what you gave to them. Not, not things of value, but how you made their life special because you were a part of it. By practicing the seven core pillars that I talked about. Okay, so clearly the answer here is A. It is the brethren, ultimately, in this philosophy of mentorship that we have, who will trust, who, who will decide whether you are indeed a Freemason or not. Okay, so with that, we have a final slide that relates to this. When can, when is someone truly a Freemason? And for that, I have to go to a very well-loved brother uh, by the name of Reverend and Worshipful Brother jo Joseph Fort Newton. He's not a Reverend because he was a past uh, Grand Chaplain or past Masonic Chaplain. He is a Reverend because he is a, a very, he, wa he was a very popular Baptist minister who became a worshipful master of his lodge. And I think one of the most beautiful uh, poems, Masonic poems uh, that has come about is be, uh, precisely because uh, he contemplated about what truly makes a man a real Freemason. And it's here. When he can look out over the rivers, the hills and the far horizon with a profound sense of his own littleness in the vast scheme of things. And yet have faith, hope, and courage, which are the root of every virtue. When he knows how to sympathize with men in their sorrows, yes, even in their sins, knowing that each man fights a hard fight against many odds. When he has learned how to make friends and to keep them. And above all, how to keep He loves flowers, get the birds without a gun, and feel the thrill of an old forgotten joy when he hears the laugh of a little child. When no voice of distress reaches his ears in vain and no hand seeks his aid without a response. When he finds good in every faith that helps any man to lay hold of divine things and sees majestic meanings in life. Whatever the name of that faith may be. When he knows how to pray, how to love and how to hope. When he has kept faith with himself, with his fellow man, with his God, in his hand, a sword of evil 
but in his heart a bit of song and glad to live but not afraid to die. Such a man is found on, has found the only real secret of masonry and one that it is trying to give to the entire world. You want more of this? He has a very popular book, uh, The Builders. Uh, this is uh, the Reverend Joseph Fort Newton. And that, if we've been talking about Masonic philosophy the whole time, we're talking about true, being a true Mason with this one poem. Brethren, I understand it was quite long. I hope, I hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, presentation today. And I hope that it has rekindled for you, for our brethren, uh, what it truly means to be a Freemason in terms of practicing the philosophy. And for our guest today, I hope that wherever you are across the world, you got a little bit more understanding of what it means when we say that we are regular Freemasons. Thank you very much. Back to you, very worshipful Dennis. Thank you very much, uh, very worshipful uh, Teddy Kalau, our senior grand lecturer, for that very interesting, enlightening, and... Uh, very uh, depth uh, discussion. Okay, um, we have questions. Quite ready? Maybe uh, you'd like yeah. to put in our Q and A uh, and and go through yes, it. Yes, uh, I have one here. Mm -hmm. uh, if it is clear that we are believers in one God, why is it that certain churches uh, persecute us? Is there a way we can resolve this aside from being patient? How clearly uh, there are many reasons why uh, religious persecution of Masons exist. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, the, the biggest source of religious persecution uh, worldwide actually uh, happens in uh, many Muslim countries. If you want to know, there is no Grand Lodge of Indonesia and there are many uh, Grand Lodges. Uh, there are many, uh, sorry, countries in the Middle East that do not have Grand Lodge. It is because uh, masonry is illegal. The second, uh, the second most persecuted uh, uh, classification of individuals in Nazi Germany after the Jews were Freemason. Okay, why is that so? Uh, there are several reasons why. The biggest reason is that there are those in. Remember that all churches are human institutions. There are those within these human institutions who politically, you know, have a, a stake in making sure that misunderstandings persist. That's one. Second, there are those who simply don't understand our philosophy. So for those, we have to really reach out and educate them, right? For the first type, well, you know, uh, if you want to know more about fake news, we will be focusing on that in our... February 2021 webinar uh, when we highlight uh, addressing these fake news. Okay, this is going to be a long road. Okay, my grandfather, uh, you know, started uh, got actually uh, in his time uh, got together with leaders of uh, his church in his time, and they actually endorsed. Uh, our philosophy, but you know, like I said, in any human institution, there are clearly those who have partisan reasons to make sure that we are persecuted. Okay, we might not resolve those within our lifetime, but as long as the truth is in your side, eventually, like those who have gone before us, we should hope that if not with us, then our, those after us will eventually resolve this. Okay, uh, I think that was the only question. Pero pa ko yata di. I think you lost it because you you we got in and out. Okay, first question. Okay. Is, uh, okay. Go ahead. Is it to be assumed that Edict Three T Three is in compliance with the law of the land? However, it is not violation of Masonic landmark, Masonic rules and regulations to permit only seven attendees to a stated meeting and disallow the others who are also in good standing from attending. I think, We're uh, not going to address that now, uh, very worshipful uh, Dennis, because that has nothing that to do with this separate, yeah. webinar. Uh, but that query will be submitted to me, and we'll take that up, uh, you know, in due course as a regular query to the to the grand lecturers. No problem. Okay. But not 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 during this webinar. Okay. I would like to suggest. Uh, 
to our rockstar lecturer of our GLP Berosu Teddy Kalaw de for to give us online and online to give us online the lectures in advance so we the brethren can have a lively discussion on the webinar topics. Um we'll give you a copy of the webinar don't yeah. we? <laughs> yeah. But brethren but, we will give you a copy of this the reason why we don't give you it in advance is that we highlight there are two reasons why one we highlight the answer of the poll so that you will know the answer after right and second sometimes there are typos that creep in uh, it's important that we correct this typo so that when it's distributed uh, what you have is a correct copy but the, this will be distributed of course after every webinar okay next question very simple kindly elaborate why monotheistic or one god only so hindus who believe in many gods are not allowed to either enter freemasonry unfortunately no Okay. Uh, you have to believe in one God, at least if, at least if you belong to the uh, regular Freemasonry, you you have to believe in one God because you must subscribe to one to believe in one divine will, that there is a divine plan for everything. Freemasonry does not provide that. There is no salvation in Freemasonry precisely because, as an ethical philosophy, it doesn't say what the divine plan is. That will be provided to you by your faith. Okay, very simple. Should, would you consider charity as a core pillar of Masonic philosophy? Yeah, uh, it's there. It's uh, one of the... Se uh, if you look at the seven core pillars, the second one is the three, uh, three core values, right? The, the, the three principal tenets, brotherly love, uh, relief, and truth. Charity is part of relief. If you look at the term charity, you also have to take note that we got that term from the King James Bible. Succeeding uh, versions of the Bible have changed the term charity to love. Uh, but it means the same thing. A perspective for the other. Okay. Brethren, is the Masonic Law Book available in National Bookstore? Uh, not yet, but definitely soon. <laughs> it's, a, it's in our uh, Masonic Supplies at the Grand Lodge. Okay, if you want to buy it. Okay, and then... I'm a faithful but don't believe in uh, VSL. Possible? Ano kaya to? If you believe in God, that's what we're all going to just focus on. If, if that means that you have a faith that uh, is, is limited to that, we're not going to question that. But you do have to believe in one God. We, we will not go beyond that. Okay. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Very worshipful, Teddy. Okay. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, thank yous and congratulations from all the brethren who have been joining us. 250 strong. And then uh, we got uh, uh, about more than 300 uh, at, uh, at our Facebook Live. So again, we'd like to thank you, Very worshipful, Teddy, for your time. Uh, very worshipful, Dennis. Yes. I guess you know I have an ad my announcement, my usual yes, yes. announcement. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, brethren, next uh, next month we will be uh, going back. This is we'll be having our second round of Masonic topics following the IMES uh, syllabus. Next month, I'm sorry, we will be finishing this first uh, round of topics. Next month we'll be focusing on Masonic liturgy, particularly the roots and genealogy of Philippine Masonic ritual. And how you can apply uh, Masonic, uh, what you learn on a daily basis. We'll focus on that before we begin our second round. There has been a slight uh, one change of topics, and that is for December. Uh, I've consulted with some senior, with some previous senior grad lecturers, and there has been concerns because of the fact that the edicts uh, relate to some very specific private matters that should be only within the fraternity. So we changed the topic. Uh, for December, but it's still going to be Masonic jurisprudence. For December, we will be talking about Masonic landmarks or understanding the fundamental elements of Masonic traditional law. By that, we mean uh, there are what we call Masonic landmarks in the Philippines. We have 25 of them. We will go into what those landmarks mean uh, in December. Uh, and we did that because the old topic contained uh, uh, topics that should be private only to the craft. So this is the topic that was changed for it. Uh, the, uh, if you get this handout, the topics are updated. So it, it, the, this handout contains an updated topic already. 
Thank you very much, very wishable Dennis. And thank you everyone for listening. Looking forward to seeing all of you again next month for our next webinar on this, uh, on, in this series. Thank you very much. Kuya Dennis. Thank you, very worshipful Daddy. In behalf of our most worshipful Grandmaster, most worshipful Agapito S1 Jr., for, thank you for all those who participated in this evening's uh, webinar series. See you again uh, November 18 okay, for our next webinar series. So to each and everyone, nice evening to each everyone, and uh, please stay safe, and uh, we'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.